Okay, uh, we'll make a start now. I'm going to continue today on the growth of ferrite, but this time we are going to have more than one solute. So along with carbon, we are also going to have substitutional solute, for example, manganese or silicon or, or whatever. And just to remind you, uh, we have an alloy which has a composition C bar, and to identify the compositions at the interface, we draw a tie line of the phase diagram and that gives us the equilibrium composition of ferrite which is in contact with austenite and here we have the composition of austenite with an equilibrium with ferrite and this is for a binary system but the fact that these compositions are connected by a tie line of the phase diagram means that we have local equilibrium at the interface, that at the position of the interface. And we obtain that tie line. We obtain that tie line by drawing a common tangent to the free energy curves of ferrite and austenite because that gives us the composition of austenite and ferrite which are in equilibrium with each other. So if you want to extend this now to a multi-component system, then obviously these curves will become surfaces in three dimensions. And I showed you this diagram in one of the lectures where these are now surfaces in three dimensions, something like this, yeah? And instead of a common tangent, we have a tangent plane which touches those surfaces and where it touches them simultaneously gives us the compositions of the two phases which are in equilibrium. Just like a common tangent construction, but now we have a plane touching two surfaces and the projection of these points onto this graph gives us the tie line. But we have the additional freedom that I can actually get a whole set of points which will remain in contact with the tangent plane if I rock that tangent plane, right? So I can generate an infinite set of tie lines on this iron X carbon plot which defines my alpha plus gamma phase field at a constant temperature. So I can have many combinations of ferrite and austenite which are in equilibrium with each other because I've now got an extra degree of freedom by adding manganese to the system. Yeah. Is everybody happy with that? So that is going to be very important when I go on to look at kinetics because you'll see that substitutional solutes diffuse something like eight orders of magnitude slower than carbon atoms. So the fact that we have a choice of tie lines that we can pick to define equilibrium at the interface helps us to maintain both solutes diffusing at the same time and still having equilibrium at the interface. I'll explain that in a bit more detail as we go through the lecture. Okay, so this is an isothermal section of the iron manganese carbon phase diagram. I'm plotting manganese here on the vertical axis, carbon on the horizontal axis, and it's at a constant temperature, right? And yet we have all these tie lines which define ferrite, which is in equilibrium with austenite. So for the purposes of this lecture, I'm assuming that we can calculate this phase diagram. And we can use a variety of software that's available to do that. And calculation of phase diagrams actually is completely based on experiments. Yeah? So you do thermodynamic measurements, create thermodynamic databases, and that allows you to calculate the tie line compositions. So as far as we are concerned, all this information is available to us. Okay, is everyone happy with that? You, know, you realize that when we say a calculation of phase diagram, we must first have the thermodynamic data. So someone has done a huge amount of work to collect those dynamic data experimentally and to put them into software which lets us do extrapolations of those data and estimate phase diagrams. So if I want that phase diagram, I can get it without any difficulty. Now, We know that when we draw the composition profile at the ferrite austenite interface, so here we have the distance z 
and the concentration. And let's assume that ferrite is uh, depleted in solute and austenite is enriched and this is my composition C bar. Here we have C gamma alpha and C alpha gamma. When this interface moves, I will have to displace some of this solute as the interface advances. Okay? And I come up with an equation that the velocity of the interface multiplied by the amount of solute that I have to push in order to maintain the concentration of the ferrite which is different from that of the austenite. So I have C gamma alpha minus C alpha gamma. So this is the rate at which solute is partitioned. Rate at which solute is partitioned. must equal the flux of solute taken away by diffusion from the peak at the interface. Must equal J at the interface where this is the flux of solute diffusing away from the interface. And that we know is a diffusion coefficient times the gradient of concentration, which is C gamma alpha minus C bar divided by the diffusion distance <coughs> Zd. So there's nothing new so far. This is a very familiar equation to you now, that the rate at which solute is partitioned must be equal to the rate at which it's being carried away by diffusion if we are going to maintain local equilibrium at the interface. Now the problem arises that we actually now have two solutes for which we have to write such an equation. So. If I now write the same equation for two different solutes, then I have the velocity of the interface times C gamma alpha 1, okay, that's for example carbon minus C alpha gamma 1 must equal the diffusivity of 1 times the gradient in the concentration of 1 at the interface. And a second equation, which is now in terms of, uh, let's say, manganese, gamma alpha minus C alpha gamma 2 into the diffusion coefficient of 2 times the gradient in two. So we could we could assume that one is carbon and two is manganese. And we know experimentally that substitutional solutes diffuse much slower than interstitial solutes. So we know that the diffusion coefficient of two is much, much smaller than the diffusion coefficient of 1. Now, we have to satisfy these equations uh, simultaneously uh, in order to maintain local equilibrium at the interface. So, must these equations must be satisfied simultaneously. Must be simultaneously 
satisfied to maintain local equilibrium. And there we have a, a basic problem. The velocity in both those equations is exactly the same. There is only one interface which is moving, right? The diffusion coefficients are different by some eight orders of magnitude. And these concentration differences in the two equations are not that different, okay? So how can we satisfy these two equations simultaneously when we have such a large discrepancy in the diffusion coefficients if you simply pick a tie line which passes through C bar. Okay, so that's, that's the question. It's difficult to do this because the diffusion coefficients are so different. Okay, so the velocity in these two equations, the velocity is identical in these equations. Since there is only one interface moving, there is only one interface moving. So if we pick C gamma alpha and C alpha gamma simply by taking a tie line which passes through C bar, we won't in general be able to satisfy these equations. So if we pick C gamma alpha and C alpha gamma, and there are four of these quantities because we have one and two, yeah. simply from the tie line, passing to C bar, then it will, be possible. it will not in general be possible to satisfy these equations simultaneously. It will not be possible general satisfy these conditions simultaneously. Because the concentration terms are similar, they are certainly not different by eight orders of magnitude as the diffusion coefficients are. Now, before I go on to explain how to solve this, I want to show you one more slide. which comes from the irreversible thermodynamics that I was talking about earlier. That previously where we had just one diffusion coefficient and one gradient in a binary system, we now actually have two gradients and the gradient of manganese can influence the flux of carbon and similarly the gradient of carbon can influence the flux of manganese. So strictly speaking, we now need four diffusion coefficients. The first one is the diffusion coefficient of carbon, the uh, second one the diffusion coefficient of manganese, and then the cross diffusion coefficient, how the gradient of manganese influences carbon diffusion, and how the gradient of uh, carbon influences the manganese diffusion. Okay? 
So it is possible to do this uh, and many of the uh, diffusion data that we have will allow you to have a matrix of diffusion coefficients including D11, D21, 12 and D22. Okay? But for the purposes of today's lecture uh, I'm going to neglect the cross diffusion coefficients just to simplify the problem. Okay? But when you are using things like mobility databases and so on they might have cross diffusion coefficients as well and in some cases it's possible to get thermodynamic representations of the cross diffusion coefficients. In other words we can derive, derive them somehow. In other cases it might be possible to neglect cross diffusion coefficients because the movement of manganese is unlikely to be strongly affected by the gradient of carbon. Yeah? Manganese moves much much slower than carbon. However the gradient of carb uh, the movement of carbon will be strongly influenced by gradients of manganese. Okay? So we are going to focus on just the diffusion coefficients for the particular element rather than the cross diffusion coefficients. <coughs> Okay, so going back to these equations at the top, the problem is that D2 is much smaller than D1. Okay? Now, these terms on the left hand side in these two equations are not that different. They're not different by eight orders of magnitude. Uh, the velocity is the same and these concentration differences are not that uh, different for manganese and carbon. But we do have this, these uh, gradients on the right hand side. This is the gradient of carbon and this is the gradient of manganese. So here's the first possible solution. Supposing we choose a tie line which reduces the concentration gradient of carbon. Okay? So instead of having a steep gradient it makes it extremely flat then the product of the large diffusion coefficient and the gradient might become comparable to the product of the small diffusion coefficient of manganese and its gradient. Yeah. So one possibility is to choose a tie line of the very large number that we have available on our ternary phase diagram such that the gradient of carbon is reduced and then the flux of manganese can keep up with the flux of carbon. I, I will summarize that again later, but do you understand? We now have a choice of tie lines, not a single tie line which passes through C bar. Given the choice of tie line, if we pick a tie line which minimizes the gradient of carbon, then the product of the large diffusion coefficient and small gradient will become comparable to that for manganese. Yeah? Is there any other way? So first we sort of minimized the gradient of carbon and picked a tie line which does that. So we are still maintaining local equilibrium at the interface. Okay? Because we, compositions are still fixed by a tie line. It's just not the tie line which is passing through C bar. Okay? So that's the first solution. What's the second solution? Absolutely right. So the diffusion coefficient of manganese is very small. So if you pick a tie line which maximizes the gradient of manganese, then the product of a small diffusion coefficient times a large gradient might be comparable to that for carbon. Okay? So I'll just write that down and then I'll go through that in a bit more detail. So there are two solutions. Two solutions. Given that we can pick a tie line, given that the tie line does not have to pass through C bar, 
upon is that we pick a tie line which maximizes the gradient of carbon uh, sorry, minimizes the gradient of carbon we pick which minimizes gradient of carbon to compensate for its large diffusion coefficient. Large diffusion coefficient. So what I want is a flat gradient of carbon, okay? So here we are plotting the concentration of carbon. So this is C bar. And this is C gamma alpha and C alpha gamma. So if I want a very gentle gradient of carbon, then the equilibrium composition of austenite must be similar to the average composition of your steel with respect to carbon, right? Yeah. So I've got to pick a tie line which will make C gamma alpha almost equal to C bar. Now the second solution is we pick a tie line which maximizes the gradient of manganese. Which maximizes gradient of manganese. So I want a steep gradient of manganese. I'm just going to rub that out. And start again. <coughs> In other words, very little manganese must partition into the austenite. And that can only happen if the composition of the ferrite with respect to manganese is similar to C bar. So we pick a tie line which allows the composition of the ferrite with respect to manganese to be the same as the average. Okay, so the ferrite will grow with almost the same manganese concentration as your alloy. So. I'm not going to ask you whether you're happy with this so far because I haven't shown you this on a diagram, but do you roughly understand what we are doing? Okay? We are compensating for the very large discrepancy between the diffusion coefficients of manganese and carbon. <coughs> okay, so Let's look at the first case where we are going to reduce the gradient of carbon. <coughs> 
Okay, so this is again manganese being plotted on the vertical axis, carbon on the horizontal axis, and the red dot specifies our alloy composition. So if I draw a horizontal line here, that gives me the manganese concentration, and a vertical line gives me the carbon concentration of our alloy. Okay? So what I want to do in order to minimize the gradient of carbon is to pick a tie line which will give me the same composition in the austenite as in the alloy with respect to carbon. So if I draw a vertical line through that red dot and wherever it hits this phase boundary defines the tie line. So that's my vertical construction line, right? Through the alloy composition where it hits the phase boundary automatically defines the tie line which controls the interface compositions. So here, for example, is the equilibrium composition of austenite and this is the equilibrium composition of ferrite. Okay. And I can derive the concentration profile at the interface simply by looking at those compositions. So here, for example, is the concentration profile for carbon. And you can see that the gradient of carbon in the austenite is very gentle. And here is the concentration profile for manganese, which again takes this point, which is the equilibrium composition of the austenite, <coughs> this point, which is the equilibrium composition of the ferrite, and this is the average manganese concentration. So we have an almost flat gradient of carbon in the austenite to compensate for its large diffusion coefficient. And manganese is being partitioned quite a lot between the ferrite and austenite. So we will get long range diffusion of manganese. So this is going to be a slow growth process. Okay? And we call this a partitioning local equilibrium mode. Local equilibrium because the compositions at the interface are connected by a tie line of the phase diagram. And partitioning because the manganese has to diffuse over a large distance since there is a big difference in the com manganese concentration of the ferrite and of your alloy as a whole. Okay? This occurs when the alloy is close to the gamma, gamma plus alpha phase boundary. In other words, the driving force for transformation is small. Okay? Everyone happy with that? Okay, let's look at the second case now. Right, so now we are going to transform under conditions where the alloy is close to the ferrite phase boundary, in other words, a large driving force. And what we want is a steep gradient of manganese in the ferrite. In other words, the manganese concentration of the alloy will be very similar to the manganese equilibrium concentration of ferrite. So if I draw a horizontal line through this point to pick my tie line, So this is just a construction line again. Where it intersects the phase boundary defines the tie line, okay, which governs the interface compositions. And notice that the average manganese concentration is now the same as the equilibrium concentration in ferrite. And we now plot the composition profiles. You can see there's a very steep gradient of manganese in the austenite to compensate for its very slow diffusion rate. And similarly, if we now plot the carbon concentration profile, there is a, a long-range diffusion of carbon. This mode of transformation tends to be faster because we are partitioning very little manganese. So it's called negligible partitioning local equilibrium, NPLE. There is very little partitioning of manganese, but we are still maintaining local equilibrium because the interface compositions are defined by a tie line. Okay? Now, how does your steel know which one to pick? Yeah. We are transforming steel, how does it know whether it should go for partitioning local equilibrium or negligible partitioning local equilibrium? 
In other words, long range diffusion of manganese or very steep gradient of manganese. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this diagram again and take an alloy, for example, uh, transforming at a high supersaturation and try and see whether I can get partitioning local equilibrium. Okay? So So this is my ternary phase diagram, carbon, manganese, gamma, alpha, and in between we have the alpha plus gamma phase field. And let's assume that I've got an alloy which is transforming uh, at a large supersaturation located over here. Okay. What happens if I try to transform it in such a way that the gradient of carbon is flat? So if I draw a vertical line through this alloy and that gives me a tie line connecting the ferrite and austenite compositions. Can somebody tell me whether that's possible? Whether it's possible to have these compositions at the interface for an alloy of that composition. So my average composition is this circle and this is what we are claiming will be the compositions at the interface. Is that possible? Can you see that the manganese concentration of both the ferrite and austenite is greater than your alloy? Yeah? That's not possible, right? So if you try to transform the alloy in that region by the partitioning local equilibrium mechanism, it will not work. And I'd like to demonstrate, uh, I'd like you to show for yourself that if I take now an alloy at a low supersaturation, and I tried to transform it by NPLE mechanism, that's also not possible. Okay? So if you can do that and hand it in to me, I will mark it as a part of your assessment. Okay? So what you have to do is take an alloy which is close to the gamma phase boundary and try and transform it by the NPLE mechanism and prove that that's not possible. Okay? So uh, if you like, I'll write it down for you. So this is your homework. So for an alloy, close to the gamma, gamma plus alpha, phase boundary prove that it is impossible to transform it by the NP LE mechanism. So if you can just bring your completed assessment with you next time with your name on it, okay? Not in Korean, all right? Uh, but in English, your name, then I will mark it. Now, if I take my phase diagram, this is the usual manganese carbon phase diagram, 
and the red lines are the tie lines and if I construct right angled triangles here okay because remember we were using vertical construction lines and horizontal construction lines and I join up the vertices of those triangles then this will be the region okay above <coughs> that dashed line will be the region where you will only be able to transform an alloy by the PLE mechanism and below the dashed line you will only be able to transform the alloy by the NPLE mechanism okay the part below the dashed line we have demonstrated already so there is no choice you know you cannot actually get it wrong okay so the system doesn't actually have to make a choice if you transform at a high supersaturation there will be negligible partitioning of manganese if you transform at a low supersaturation there's long range diffusion of manganese and the transformation will be very slow okay it's just a uh, identifying the domains now if you use uh, programs like Dictra and so on you will find that as you lower the transformation temperature the diffusion spike the concentration gradient of manganese becomes extremely narrow and steep until it gets to atomic dimensions and that's not physically correct you know we, we cannot tolerate concentration gradients which are that large because other effects come into play and you get to a point where manganese simply will not move carbon is able to move but manganese is not able to move so as I lower the transformation temperature we will get to a point where you can no longer have equilibrium the manganese is effectively frozen and is trapped as the ferrite grows So as the transformation temperature is reduced is reduced manganese uh, ceases to be able to diffuse okay so ceases To be mobile but carbon can still diffuse so we cannot any longer have equilibrium between the ferrite and austenite therefore equilibrium breaks down and we get instead the state of para equilibrium where the interstitial solutes can move but not the substitution of solids. So instead we get par equilibrium. So instead where manganese does not partition at all but subject to that constraint the carbon reaches equilibrium between ferrite and austenite okay so the carbon is locally in equilibrium but not the manganese 
so but subject to that constraint carbon has local equilibrium at interface. Now, we can no longer use the equilibrium phase diagram because the manganese to iron ratio remains constant. We are not moving manganese. We have to define a new phase diagram, which we call a paraequilibrium phase diagram. And it will look quite different So this is now a para-equilibrium phase diagram. And notice that the two phase boundaries uh, between ferrite and austenite so here we have ferrite, this is austenite, and this is alpha plus gamma. The two phase boundaries meet at a point on the vertical axis. Can somebody tell me how I can draw tie lines on this diagram? Okay, so remember, manganese is not partitioning. So what will the tie lines on this diagram look like? Horizontal, yeah. <coughs> so horizontal. Now, they are not strictly horizontal, okay? Because, you know, if you have different carbon concentration in the austenite and ferrite, then even though manganese has not moved, you will get a different concentration of manganese in the ferrite and austenite. It's the manganese to iron ratio that remains constant. But because the carbon concentration is so small, it's almost horizontal, okay? So that's our para-equilibrium phase diagram. And in all of the software like Thermocalc and Empty Data and so on, you can also calculate a paraequilibrium phase diagram as well as an equilibrium phase diagram. And very often when we are doing calculations, it's much easier to assume that the growth of ferrite happens in paraequilibrium because then it reduces to a binary problem. There's no movement of manganese. And because in the steel industry, we process steel extremely rapidly, yeah. millions and millions of tons, usually the cooling rate is so high <coughs> that ferrite will almost always form by a para-equilibrium mechanism. Yeah. So this is very convenient because then you can just use all the theory for binary transformations, but binary alloys. Only the carbon is partitioning. So the tie lines are almost horizontal and I'd like to show you the relationship between the para-equilibrium and equilibrium phase diagrams. So here we have both of them drawn. Uh, the heavy lines on the outside represent the equilibrium phase diagram with tie lines which are defined by thermodynamics and inside there the light lines represent the para-equilibrium 
phase diagram. Can somebody tell me why the equilibrium and paraequilibrium phase boundaries meet on the horizontal axis? Why do they coincide on the horizontal axis? Hmm? Yeah, there's no manganese, so there's no difference between equilibrium and paraequilibrium, right? Why does the paraequilibrium phase boundary meet at a point on the vertical axis? There's no carbon, right? Uh, and manganese is not moving, so both ferrite and austenite have to have exactly the same manganese concentration, right? So the tie line has shrunk to a point if there's no carbon at all. So the paraequilibrium phase diagram lies within the equilibrium phase diagram and it will meet the equilibrium phase diagram when there is no manganese at all in the steel, okay? So this was quite complicated, you know, to learn about just after having had lunch, but I think you answered some of the questions very well. Go through the notes that I've also written and you'll be very easily able to explain the role of the third element, the substitutional solute on the kinetics of the growth of ferrite, okay? So that's all there is for today and in the next lecture we'll be talking about perlite which is the other major phase in the vast majority of steels that are manufactured.